I'm Leila Saad, and my life is driven by one burning question. How can I become a good ancestor? How can I create a legacy of healing and liberation for those who are here in this lifetime and those who will come after I'm gone? In my pursuit to answer this question, I'm interviewing change makers and culture shapers who are also exploring that question for themselves in the way that they live and lead their life. It's my intention that these conversations will help you find your own answers to that question too. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. Welcome, good ancestors, and welcome to today's episode, a journalist, author, and academic who sparked a global conversation on white feminism when her Guardian article, How White Women Use Strategic Tears to Silence Women of Color, went viral all around the world. Ruby Hammond's powerful and well-researched book, White Tears, Brown Scars, How White Feminism Betrays Women of Color, was one of my favorite reads this past year, and I was honored to receive an early review copy. I have been recommending it to everyone. This book deeply explores white supremacy, white feminism, and racism in historical colonial contexts all around the world. And then it brings us into the modern day to discuss the significance of events like the 2020 Amy Cooper incident, where cops were called to New York Central Park on Christian Cooper for false racist claims while he was bird watching. This is a book I want everyone to read, and you'll want to leave this conversation wanting to read it too. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Good Ancestor Podcast. I am here with the author of the brand new book, um, White Tears, Brown Scars, Ruby Hammond. Ruby, welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. Hi, Leila. Thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to have you. Um, I love your book. I just want to say that <laughs> first and foremost. Thank you so much for uh, sending me an advanced copy. I have been studying it truly because it is such a well-researched book, um, a book that not only speaks about the dynamics of white womanhood and white tears, but goes into the history. And I really want to have a conversation about that today. Um, But before we start, our very first question for every guest, who are some of the ancestors, living or transitioned, familial or societal, who have influenced Mm -hmm. you on your journey? So um, definitely familial, my sisters um, and my father. Uh, My sisters are are very much still alive and and my father has uh, passed on and it is a, you know, one of the great... um, uh, I guess sadnesses of uh, I don't I don't like to talk too much about my family because the way I see it is you know I chose a public life they didn't but mm. um, you know one of my my deepest sort of sadnesses that he has he hasn't sort of been he's not here to kind of see me get my my stuff together you know um, and 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 start to really take to take um, that, that that pride and that love of where I'm from and where mm. he's from, you know, the, the, the Middle East. Um, and, you know, and, and in terms of, of um, sort of my, my uh, societal ancestors, I'm, I'm not religious, but um, the philosoph- as a philosopher, um, Imam Ali is probably um, one of, you know, someone that I, I go back to. And in, just in, in terms of uh, what we're speaking about today, I have a little, um, I know I'll forget it, so I'll, I'll read it. It's just a yeah. small uh, Please. Says, Nothing hurts a good soul and a kind heart more than to live amongst people who cannot understand it. And I really think that, um, or, or, you know, when we look at what we're about to talk about with my book, it is that so much of, of, of uh, how um, people of, of colour, uh, you know, during the colonial era, so wherever uh, Europeans colonised, they didn't understand what it was that was in front of them mm. and the damage, the damage that has been wrought out of that lack of understanding. And then we also, you know, that sort of that, that quote hits me on a personal level now too because I still see it as I'm sure you have and, and, and others of us who, who write, 
this this stuff and not even necessarily write it we, we live it is that it, it, it's this we say we think we're saying something that is either where we're either trying to seek understanding or point out a problem um, mm. but it, we get hit with this as if we're being as if we're the problem so right right that yeah. um that leads into you know what i really yeah. wanted to ask you about before we dive into the content of your book one of the things that really struck me about your story was the similarities that we've had in terms of both being catapulted into the public eye because of writing a viral article mm -hmm. about white women. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, you know, I was listening to yeah. a, an interview of yours and you were writing about how you'd written this article, um, how white women use strategic tears to silence women of color for the Guardian in Australia. And first of all, I'm sure that there was some fear or some hesitation or some trepidation on your part before publishing something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, now we're used to talking about these things like they're normal in the mainstream, but back mm -hmm. then we weren't, right? And then the other thing That's is right. you didn't think it would go beyond Australia. And it went right. far beyond Australia. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's exactly on both. Like, um, well, you know, it's not to say that it wasn't being written and, and spoken about by uh, um, in Australia. <laughs> it really kind of okay, not in the mainstream, definitely not. Um, so I knew that to, to write that I would that there was just going to be a reaction of what is she even talking about? Like, what is she saying? Like, uh, uh, is she saying that white women can never get sad or cry? You know, I knew that there would, there would be that. And and also that um, because Australia is small and I, I just thought um, this is this going to kind of be like the kiss of death for me in, um, you know, my career and, and in anything, um, you know, my, my sort of my standing in sort of the, the progressive and, and feminist space. Uh, but... You know, so with me, it's like when I feel that something has to be said, I can't help. Like I, I'll, you know, it, it's kind of like no, this is important, and I knew it, instinctively it was really important because, um, you know, the reaction that I would get from women when I would, you know, before I even wrote the article, I was mm. kind of like, you know, I was looking at my own experience, and and then I, I would, I would see tweets from you know black women in in Canada and and, and America. Um, talking about, you know, experiences they had at work and articles. And, and then I'm like, is this the same thing? Right? Mm. Is, you know, when, when black women are talking about how they're, you know, not to say it's the same thing, but, but is it the same dynamic that that's causing, you know, is what I'm experiencing related to this, to, mm. to what black women, you know, and, and so that's why I shared um, uh some, some tweets that, I, that I, I read by black women and, and we're you know, talking about a dynamic at work between a black woman and a white woman where something will happen, the white woman will cry, but she won't be crying because she feels bad. She'll cry because um, she feels bullied. And I'm like, is this, is this, what, you know, is this, is this what I've experienced? Because it seems like it. And so, you know, I shared it with my followers on Facebook because um, I wanted to see whether other, you know, women of colour in Australia Mm. whether that applied, applied to them too. And that's so key, I think, yeah. because oftentimes um, other countries who, that are not American will point the finger at America and say that's where the real yeah. problem is, exactly. but we don't, we don't have a problem here. Absolutely, and Australia right. is very, very guilty of that, of, you know, when we look at police brutality and um, uh, it's, it's kind of like, oh, it's hor horrible. It's like, it's like quite, you're aware of the, of the violence against, you know, Indigenous people here and in, in, in the prison system and the carceral system. So there's very much a sense of it's uh, kind of tut tutting at, 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 at the problems that the US has with race without looking um, that we, you know, we, we've got our own and more, but, but we, there's this real still kind of denial or, or even that could not be like this sort of surface level acceptance but no real um, effort or a, a willingness to, to really dive into it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's the process with writing that, that article is I, I just wanted to see how, you know, is, is this what I think it is and how widespread is it? Because, um, you know, it's something that's not enough for me if it's just something that's happened to me. It's not quite enough. 
it's depending on the story and if it's unless you're actually just writing a personal story right um, right but it, you know if i'm writing something political i i need to see that w- is what's happened to me uh indicative of a bigger problem with our society and that's how that that's how that started um and so yeah there was a lot there was a, you know i was quite i was quite scared because i just thought it's going to be misunderstood it's going to be misrepresented um and i was just wasn't expecting uh to to take off as much um as it did overseas and, mm. and that's kind of what really yeah um, yeah and so in it it, in the, i guess um you know you're saying how you wanted to know is this indicative of a bigger mm. problem the answer came back clearly yes right yeah. right yeah. <laughs> and oh, well, so many women were like yep this has happened to me yep this is i was like how is this happening to like almost every woman of color and we're actually we're actually not talking about it right so that's that's the really interesting part right because yeah. we are um universally experiencing it and yet uh white women women who have white privilege um are unaware that it's even happening. So how is that how is that happening? You know, there's the book um racism without racists. How is how is racism happening yet there are no people who are enforcing the racism. Exactly. Um uh yeah, it's it's exactly that. It's like we all we all recognize that racism is a problem and yet you know even donald trump will say i'm the least racist for well, then who is like who is, is the most racist, racist? Yeah. i would love to know or even and like so where is like like uh, uh, is there a hierarchy of races it's quite bizarre but um and, and so you know a lot of that goes to back to uh because we we do look at, at, at um racism as a moral failing as a um or as sim- as only a moral failing you know other people have been about this including robin d'angelo and, and and that um rather than a like a, an institutional structural problem that was deliberately mm-hmm. you know created in order to maintain power differentials and and, and power structures and so um Yeah well, uh, and and you use the word um strategic in that article mm-hmm. and I felt that that was really important and as I explored your book it became even more clear to me why that word was the right word strategic that this is not the exception to the rule it's not an accident it doesn't happen sometimes or with certain kinds of people it's actually what the norm is as opposed to what just happens every now and then how did you come to that realization um and and i know you've done deep research which is laid out mm-hmm. in the book but what were the breadcrumbs that you were following um so i'm i'm taking my mind back to when i first wrote the article how are you i know it's in the title but how you know i don't write the title but how i used it in the article was it's the strategy yeah so yeah so so to me it was about um that it's a very it's a definite it's a strategy it's a move a tactical move of okay how um yeah i'll, I'll put myself in the white woman's position here is okay i'm being challenged or i'm being disagreed with or i'm being embarrassed or called out i don't like this feeling um i need to you know recalibrate i need to get my position oh, which is above this woman of color even though we never really talk about it i am above her because this society says i am how do i um how do i re re uh, re uh, rebalance um and that's that's the tactic that has been um and the strategy that has been um offered to white women or given to white women as a you know due to the the history of how um western society developed um mm. as a result or uh, throughout colon- the colonial era which you know also then went back to the metropole right so what was happening in the colonies um went back a- a- and and affected what was happening in europe and so the strategy is that white women in white society beginning in the colonial era uh had this dual 
uh, role as um, they needed to be protected from, you know, the the, the indigenous and, 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 and enslaved populations, the, the, you know, the savages. And they, um, at the same time, they, um, because of that, that role of, of protector, they also um, needed to be, uh, you know, subordinated or, or, or deferential to, to men. And so, so they have this role as, as both protector of, or, or protected from the, you know, the, the brown and black masses. But then they also have this civilizing role of white men where they have, they're meant to sort of subdue the white man's sort of wild and, and, and base instincts, right? Because this moral, virtuous white woman. Um, and so, you know, how that sort of, Trend that's obviously like, you know, we're not all, we're not thinking about all this. this. This has just been passed on down to us and it's become part of, you know, the, the, right. the, the invisible system that, that, that we all live in and, and don't we see, but don't see. And, and so it, it's the um, white, white women have been afforded an innocence and protection as long as it's not from white men. Right. Because when, right. when it becomes white, so this, when it becomes from, right. that's that's where it falls down. This is right? the key part. So this is something yeah. that, you know, obviously as somebody who is a writer in this work and a student as well, um, one of the things that I found that really I had an aha moment for the first time about a nuance here in these relationships mm-hmm. is oftentimes we look at what is the relationship between white women and women of color. But mm-hmm. as I was reading your book, I was like, wow, look at the relationship between white women and white men yeah. and how a lot of the violence that is enacted on black and brown people is a, I, is, it, it flows out from the really messed up dynamics between white women and white men, um, not just from the regards of white men have privilege as males and they are enacting Mm -hmm. that privilege, but also the ways in which white women have used their position as not being in the same position as white men, but not being in the same position as people of color to kind of play both sides, right? Being both the victim of the violence of white male privilege, but Mm -hmm. also the upholders of white male privilege and, uh, and, and white privilege. And it, there was something so sick about it as I continued to read. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the things that I'm thinking about were the stories about how, in fact, you had a really, you had a really great co- quote that I, wanna, that I wanna share, which was about lynchings. Mm-hmm. And you said lynching in the, in the United States was driven partly by the fear of interracial relationships between white women and black men and the impact that mixed race offspring would have on white supremacy, right? So it, it wasn't really about we need to protect white women because there were white women who, who were, I would say forcing themselves on black men because it's there's a power dynamic during those times where there was they were not on equal uh, terms. Yeah. They are yeah. they are in quote unquote relationships or forcing themselves upon uh, black men and and men of color, indigenous men, right? And yet, yeah, you know, the lynchings were said to be about protecting white womanhood, protecting the purity of white women, um, uh, protecting them from being raped by these, you know, black brutes, quote unquote. But really it was about, we cannot let the white race be, be marred. We cannot, we cannot let um, interracial relationships um, happen because the more mixed race people we have, the less white power we're going to have. Exactly. Um, that's, that's exactly right. And, and, you know, that's what, uh, um, uh, you know, Ida Wells was was writing at at, at the time, the, 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 the black journalist who was documenting the the lynchings and who was quite um, 
derided in her time for it, of course. So, you know, <laughs> again, the kind hearted soul that is, you know, that that's that's misunderstood or not understood in, in, in her time. Um, I mean, she, you know, she had a lot of respect in her time, but she also was was very, um, yes, was highly, highly degraded. And, and uh, because she reported on it that the lynchings and she was adamant this is not really there the, this is not about protecting they keep saying it's about protecting the women and it's not so so she went would go in you know she was, was talking about the the economic the um the the, the, the fear that uh, uh, that white men and white society had of a free black population that mm. would, would be able to challenge them economically that would be able to to threaten um because you think about it they know an identity built first on you know just possession of the indigenous people and their land and then built on this you know slavery and and then that so it's an it's an identity of superiority yes um and when you take that away they it's like they don't they they didn't know who they were anymore so there was massive pushback and so it all sort of became, you know, like the white woman's body was like the, this terrain that that was fought on of, of um, a wheel, wheel just uh, protect, we'll protect her and we'll project our own fears and violence back on, onto black men and black women and by saying that um, they're trying to hurt our, our women, our quote unquote women. Um, right. And yeah, and it, so you know, well, it's so, so it, it's so incredible to see how something that we that may be a situation at work, right, where um, strategic white woman tears are being yeah, used, or back, yeah. the example of Amy Cooper in the park, right? Like mm-hmm. how these um, seemingly, seemingly just like isolated incidents are actually just a. Uh, repeat of what has happened throughout history. It isn't something that's just happening now. It has deep historic links, and those historic links are about power. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you see with Amy Cooper is a great example. I mean, that happened after I wrote the book, but but she, um, uh, for those who, who, who may not know, so she's a, a, a white woman walking her park in, a, you know, in the, the dog park in in uh, a Brooklyn park and or Central Park was it a, a, a park in New York and uh, there was a, a black man bird watching and we don't see their the their initial um, uh, sort of altercation or conflict but, but we, when the when the footage starts so the man was filming it and we just see her saying I. Yeah. I'm going to call the police and tell them that an African American man is threatening me and my dog. Bam! Like mm-hmm. that's that's um, that's the strategy. Like that's what I, I'm talking about. That that power of she knows that history is just recalled it, um, it without without you know having to 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 say it all. Uh, she's recalled this history of I know. We both know, right? She's telling him, we both know that all I have to do is snap my fingers like this and say that a black man is trying to hurt me. We know what's going to happen to you, don't we? So that's that's really such a good example of what I, I talk about of that dynamic. And so I call it the damsel in distress, the damsel in defense. So mm-hmm. we have this damsel in distress and this protection, but then she becomes a damsel in defense of white society because that's what, you know, that that's what... You know, in in that situation, Amy Cooper was doing. She was defending, um, in attacking him, defending the the system that white and uh, white uh, you know slavery and, and colonialism and, and white society had set up, um, where which which would just you know come down on the bodies uh, of black men and black women and and brown women as well. But in that particular situation come down the body of, of, of a black man because he wasn't doing what she wanted him to, what she mm-hmm. told him to, because he was not fulfilling, you know, his role on on this sort of this racial hierarchy that, that whiteness um, had built. And and so that dynamic is um, 
you know, it's what, what happens between white women and women of colour is reflective of that. You know, it's part of, it's part of that. It's that same, um, uh, you know, white women are able to, to lean in to the privileges that their race gives them, even though, uh, you know, Western feminism, white feminism is, is, you know, predicated pretty much solely on gender oppression. So that's why we have, you know, women of colour have such a hard time uh, getting white women and white feminists especially to, to see because they, the, um, where we're coming from because Western feminism and white feminism has not, um, it's, it's not developed in a way that acknowledges that race, that, uh, that there's a racial privilege conferred on white women um, right. because of the actions of white men. Um, how is it that something that I'm thinking about, right, is using Amy Cooper as an example, but really any white woman who has ever used their tears in this way, ever used their strategy, no one has ever sat them down to talk to them about, this is a strategy that you can use, right? How, yeah. But, but yeah, yet, it's it's, right, yeah. but <laughs> yet it's called upon with such ease, almost as if it's been there lodged in the back of the mm. mind the whole time. How is this passed down? That's that's something that I've really been thinking about. You know, we because of um, social media and the rise of technology, we're seeing more and more of these videos of so-called barbecue Becky and you know park Becky and all of these white women using white tears. But it it comes up so easily, and yet outside of that situation where they feel that where they feel or believe that they are threatened as vulnerable white women, um, they may look at another white woman doing that and say, I would never do that. But yet when they're in that situation, it comes forth so easily. How is that passed down? You know, this is a podcast about ancestors. Um, their ancestors yeah, yeah. use this same technique over and over yeah. again. Um, yeah. So uh, look, this is, Obviously, a, a, a hard question to to answer in uh, you know with with full authority because I'm not there. Um, I'm not around white people when there's only white people, mm -hmm. so I don't know, right? Uh, I don't know exactly how everything that is said. Um, but uh, you know, I don't. You know, I don't think it's. it's okay, I said it's not. That's not uh, as you said. Sorry, it's not something that's that's taught. It's like, okay, so when a black woman does this. Um, right. Or a brown woman does this. This is what you do. Uh, I think that it's it's we are um, we receive these messages um, that we absorb, and that's why I speak a lot about pop culture in the book because yes. pop culture is a big way that that's done, and or and art and and high culture as well, like opera. I talk about opera a little bit. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, it's a way in which messages are repeated again and again. And, and so when I think about okay, so how do white women know? I'm like, well, how do I know, you know, as a as an Arab woman, as a brown woman, how do I know when when I can't push something any further, right? Because this is a there's I implicitly know that okay, um, this uh, this isn't going to work well for me. Like if I push this further, um, people are not going to believe me. They're not right. going to see my side, right? So I instinctively know that that. Um, uh, no one had to sit down and tell me, um, yes. right? So, and I and I think that the same goes. We we yes. we we know um, of these. It's just this unspoken and 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 I, and I would say an unrecognized uh, in a lot of us because I didn't sort of you know I wasn't really fully aware, but like I just kind of something that I I guess accepted. I'd be like, oh, I know that. Um, I could give an example, like when I when I was in New York, and and you know, without going I I into details, there was this massive um, this massive sort of fallout between my two roommates, and then I got dragged into it, and then um, there were both white white women, but one of them was quite a you know very, very younger and petite, and I um, so she's so saying to me, um, I want to call the police on, you know, so then on the other one, and I'm just like, let's not involve the police, please. 
And then, um, she, you know, and then she's like, well, why are you upset with me? She says, are you turning against me too? Or maybe I should call the police on both of you. And I just stopped and I went, and I knew, like, mm-hmm. um, nothing is actually going on. So first of all, I should be wasting the police's time. But there was this, I just knew, I was like, oh, wow. If police get called here and there's this younger, you know, white girl with her big, you know, sad eyes crying, uh, there's no way in the world that they'll believe me. And, and you know, uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's what I'm talking about. We, we right. know instinctively um, that because we know that, you know, we grow up in a society that we know that our, we are devalued. And I, as an Arab woman, I, you know, you know, I was 13 when I was first called a terrorist. This is well before 9-11. So that's always been there. So there's always been this this scepter of, of that we're violent, that we don't fit in, we don't belong here, and that we could just sort of, you know, turn at any moment. Um, so these are all the messages. And, and that's why I speak about sort of the different races and, and the background to how they've been. Not, not, you know, I don't try to give a history of each race, but it's a history, a brief history of how the, each race has been represented Yes. By, by the West. And it's, those are two different things. So, yes. Um, I really appreciated um, that, actually. And it's similar. Different. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I really so, appreciated so that. There were some tropes that you pulled out, which some of them mm. I know from, you know, just because we are aware of them. So, for example, as a Black woman, um, though, though not um, uh, uh, African-American, I'm aware of the tropes of the mommy, of the sapphire, of the Jezebel, um, even if I didn't have specific names for them like that, I know yeah. what those tropes are. I've seen them, I've experienced them and so on. Um, but what I really appreciated in your book, and I'm just pulling them up here, is you also broke down what are some of those tropes for women of other cultures. Um, and there was it was like two sides where there was the sexualized side. And then on the flip side of that was the angry or aggressor side. So for example... Yeah right? With the, with black women, we're aware of the sexualized Jezebel. Um, and then the other side is the Sapphire. So the angry black woman, the sassy black woman, but I hadn't heard, um, of, um, this idea of black velvet for Aboriginal women in Australia. Mm. Um, and the princess Pocahontas of native American women, the China doll of East Asian women, that these are tropes, stereotypes that are used to sexualize and stereotype and really limit women of color in this way. And then the flip side of that, you know, for East Asian women, the dragon lady, for Latina women, the the sexy, uh, the, what was it? The spicy sex, sex pot. Um, Mm -hmm. And in each time it's like, in no way, in each in each um, stereotype or in each trope, it limits us in a different way each time, yeah. whether we are expressing our authentic feelings of anger or are exp- expressing our sexuality in authentic ways, mm-hmm. we're not uh, we're not allowed access to that because of the trope that we're going to be put into. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when uh, if we are you know expressing sexuality, then it's like, oh yeah, see. They're easy. They're they're this. They're that. Um, and then, of course, the the angry ones. The, that's you know that's that's one's the real kicker now because it, it just it, it invalidates. It, 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 it's it's a uh, you know anger is rewritten as a this irrational, intrinsic, um, uh, volatile uh, uh, characteristic. Um, that, that black and, and, and brown women have rather than uh, maybe we're angry because of how we're treated and this is not, you know, this is anger is the only logical response here. Um, yes. and, and what I found fascinating when I dug into that history, um, like I wanted to, um, I wanted to, to see, like I, I wanted to look, to look at and discuss the uh the key stereotypes sort of limiting each woman of colour. What I was not expecting was how 
similar they were the different but but similar in the sense of they served the same purpose it, yes but, but they were just applied because differently right so so you know um indigenous women and black women felt um the full brunt of it because a uh, it was indigenous women it's their land that was being taken so it was like they were they were here trying to wipe them out and, and then black women because they were enslaved um but essentially they're all about um positioning uh the the woman um you know the racialized woman as permissive and as not um you know uh, not only not uh, saying no to white men but seeking it out right and that that was a metaphor for and you know edward said who's another ancestor i i look up to so he um he uh Hey, said that that it's a it's this a metaphor for uh, the surrendering of their land, right? You surrender mm -hmm. the woman's sexuality, you surrender their land. It's like, and that is really encompassed very well in the Princess Pocahontas myth, right? Where where she she's just like, so yes, the white man come and take me. It's like basically saying, come and take this land. I recognize. I I am the peacemaker, but I'm a peacemaker in a way that I you know, I recognize the superiority of your ways and the virility of your men, right? So over mine, um, and you know, and then you just think, well, you know, so what? That's just a representation, but you know, these are these are enacted upon, right? And they're repeated again and again and again to the point where. That's just what people think, uh, and uh, you know, an indigenous woman is, or an indigenous man is. That's just what people think an Arab person is, either a terrorist or a religious. Right, man, whether, a whether they know they think no. that or not. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. These, these, these are just implicitly um, uh, uh, accepted, and then that they're replicated, and um, you know, this dynamic plays out in mm -hmm. our day to day interactions. So, so that's what I was trying to show in this book is that the, the what we what we what we encounter in our day to day interaction is not only reflective of our society but of history. Yeah. And, and so, those two sort of so so each sort of the race of, of women has like the you know the angry, and then mm -hmm. there's others within them. But the two to the two main archetypes are binary. So you have the you know the the sexually permissive and promiscuous and then you have the angry so they correspond to the the stage of colonialism right because early colonialism was about spreading out you know, spreading um you know the the empire yeah. um, and so the women and uh, the women and then therefore the, the 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 whole culture was positioned as being like yeah come and take it you know and then where the where the anger comes out, like the angry stereotype, um, you know, the dragon lady and the, the you know the angry black woman, is uh, when colonized people began organizing and resisting abolition mm -hmm. um, in the U.S. When, and so as as the colonized were resisting, um, then it was just that was when they were like, all right, okay, we're gonna we're gonna project again, we're gonna project uh, our violence back onto them and say that they're attacking us even yeah. though they're actually they're actually they were just resisting um so that's when the and that's how we're still seen and limited today as women of color we're expected it may not you know be uh, necessarily sexual but it's that same sort of we're expected to be permissive and placating not put up a fight and just accept what's given given and just be like oh okay um all right you you okay. know best what's right uh, for me. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and i won't you know and oh you want to take my work and say it's yours mm, okay well i can't you know but you stand up for yourself right. whoa right what's this why yes. are you attacking me where is this so it's like where is this coming well, from right yeah. We're yeah. in this position where we're either expected to live a life where we can't be, um, you know, we can't uh, contribute, we can't uh, live as full members of society. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we start, because um, when we start asserting ourselves, that it's very, very quickly spun as uh, as we're being aggressive, we're being, we're, we're provoking, we're being irrational. Um, so. You know, we we yeah. we we're, we're still still boxed at how I put it. We're boxed into this binary. We're still in that um, of of having to either 
just be supplicants or uh, any 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 attempt to to be like no I deserve to be you know live the full expression of my humanity is it's like no not you you can't you're that that they, it's reframed as angry and that again goes back to the way in which white society developed in the colonies which is its entire identity was was built on on differentiating itself first of all uh, yes. from the people colonized and then the people that get brought over and then the people that immigrated um, because they were getting away from the colonialism in their own countries right, right. Um, so so it's this constant uh, process of, of reiterating difference and superiority mm. um, based on that difference and so when I applied that to feminism I'm like well how can we have a sisterhood when we haven't acknowledged that 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 binary that why society placed between itself and everybody else uh, is replicated in spaces where there's just women, and that there is you know that's that that sort of that that strategy that I talk about where they they lean into that they lean into to to this their own archetype of the damsel in distress uh, and, and uh, uh, oh why you know what help and, and so. Um, all these hundreds of years of, of, of um, you know, the white, the, the white, innocent white woman in need of protection, that has just kind of, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's just become part of, 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 of our society and, and to the point where when a white woman, unless, as I said, unless, <laughs> unless, it, unless the culprit is, 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 a, is a white man. a white man. man. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, uh, obviously in some cases, yes, she's believed when, when he's particularly egregious but when it's her husband and that's why you know domestic violence is not taken seriously um if she alleges sexual assault and the man you know the white man is a powerful man or a man who's a good father you know so all these things are like or even you know when men uh when violent men um kill their entire family it's still like spoken of many times and in australia it definitely is of oh it's so sad oh he must have been it must he must have been going through such a hard time it's like Maybe, but to take every, like there's 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 right. an element of power there, and and there's this I mean, and, extreme violence. Um, right. So so we can't sort of accept. Um, we can't. We still have this trouble accepting uh, as much as we can accept that 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 brown and black people can be violent to the point where their position is violent when they're not being violent. Mm. The flip side is that. Um, white men even when they are being violent are reframed as just being like oh it must be so hard for him right there's a there's a quote that um that stood out for Mm -hmm. me in your book um white people set the standard for humanity by which they and only they could succeed and you know you talk a lot in the book about the construction of white womanhood and how how womanhood is has that white supremacy has defined womanhood as white womanhood. And so there is, there is no sisterhood because we are not the same as them, not because intrinsically we're not the same as them biologically. We're not the same as them. No, but because they have created a world in which they are different to them, to us, they are superior to us. Uh, They are the standard of womanhood by which we are supposed to measure ourselves up against the closer that we can bring ourselves to that, the better, but we will never be them. And so how can there be a sisterhood on that basis? How can there be any, um, you know, so many women of color, so many black women, myself included, have been asked to put talk of race aside. You're being divisive when you talk about Mm -hmm. racism. Let's band together under our shared struggle of, um, of, of sexism. And uh, one of the um, uh, activists, um, I think she was a poet that you spoke about in the book was Frances Harper and how in 1866 at the 11th National Women's Rights Convention um, in New York with a crowd that included Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, she spoke up to the white woman and she said, this is what the situation is. And so we've been saying this for a very, very, very long time. And yet there are still repeated calls, put race aside. We are sharing the struggle of sexism. That, you know, that, that her story amazed me. Like if I could feel, like I said, I felt 
scared to, to write what I wrote in 2018 in Australia. Imagine being a black woman in 1866, standing up at, you know, the, the, the women's rights convention where white women don't even have the vote yet and telling them, basically saying, listen, uh, until you recognise and um, account for and change, the way you treat us as, 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 as the ongoing, uh, you know, uh, 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 treatment and of, of black women, including, you know, in the North, yes, you don't have slavery. It's just say so you don't have slavery here anymore, but I still can't get on a streetcar and ride with you. And when I get on a streetcar, a white woman will get off. Right. So, that, so she says to them, I, you know, you speak of rights. I'm actually speaking of wrongs. And I'm, I'm saying that you have something to do with this. Mm. The, the way that my life is as a black woman, where that I, where I can't, um, you know, she's, 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 I, I encourage everyone to seek out that speech. It's not that long and it's on the internet. It's, it's Francis Harper. We are all bound up in, um, one great, uh, was it one great lump of humanity? I should have say lump. She was much more poetic than that. But, but <laughs> one great bundle of humanity. Uh-huh. Um, and so it's exactly what she said. It's what we now call intersectionality, right? right. It's always been there just because it has this, this, this term now. Like, like you know, uh, uh, and I'm not downplaying Kimberly Crenshaw's work uh, at all, but the point is that it's um, black women uh, uh, especially and then through, you know, black women, other women of colour um, in, in the West have also started to speak up. It, it's a, a look, um, you know, it's not that we don't want, a real sisterhood, but until you acknowledge and you see your role mm. in in the racism we feel, then how can we fight equally against sexism as sisters? Um, and so, you know, so so that goes back to that long ago, eighteen sixty six. It's just the same. Listen, white women, I mean, you know, until you recognize your role in. In all of this, you can get the vote, but, but it's actually it's not going to change everything. Mm. It's not going to change anything. One of this, right, yes, yeah, one of the stories that you shared in your book uh, um, was the story of Lisa Benson, and I was really happy to see a recent talk with her. Um, yes, yeah. yeah. Can you um, share about that? And so, Lisa Benson is a black woman journalist. Um, mm-hmm. shared your article with her co-workers and what happened. Yeah. So she, um, so she's, she's a, a, she was on contract. She's a, a journalist in Kansas City at a TV station. So, and so she's been working at the station for 14 years. Um, so she shared the article because, well, she was already going through a, a hard time because, and she, to the point where she'd actually already filed a racial discrimination lawsuit against her employers she was still working there at the time uh, so she shared that article um, you know she told me in the hopes of that they would understand what she's going through of, of, of how their behavior was affecting her mm-hmm. but of course the way that it was received was oh you're being racist against white women right you're bullying white women and so, so even when we're just talking about being bullied, we're still reframed as bullies, right? So she she was suspended right away and then terminated from her contract um, as a result of sharing that article on her Facebook page because um, it was, quote, unquote, created a hostile work environment based on race and gender or race and sex. Uh, so Which when she paused called, there. I mean, what did they yeah. think that they had created for her? Exactly. Right. Well, this is the thing. Um, like uh, it goes back, like they knew what they were creating for her and, right. and it was un- untenable for her. But, uh, the, you know, why, you know, what I've discovered uh, 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 or, or realised, not discovered, what I've realised is that um, so much of white society, a Western society in the white society is, it's, it's, a, it's the pretense. As long as you, it's not about what you really are, it's what you can present yourself as being, right? So if a company can say, well, look, we've got, some black people, we've got some Indian people, we're diverse, we've got women, you know, as long as you can present yourself as being something, then you don't have to really be that. So, um, you know, she she was um, really uh, not just dissatisfied with her work, she was 
she was really, she was hurt, she was upset, she was frustrated. She worked for 14 years, wouldn't, didn't get a promotion, and even though she'd won an Emmy for her coverage of Barack Obama's uh, inauguration, so you can't say she, she didn't have the talent or the skills or the work ethic. She'd put her hand up for all the, um, uh, the week, you know, the weekend shifts that nobody wanted. So she was doing the work but not getting the reward, and I'm sure a lot of women of colour um, watching will... will recognize that and so she shared that article and yes she got terminated um and um just sort of what friends she still had there were kind of gone by that point so she was feeling really isolated and that's when she contacted me um and yeah of course i was horrified so i i um i, I did all i could to, to get her story out there but um and, and, and I and listened to it off on the internet. But, yeah, yeah. And, and in listening to your recent conversation with her, you know, um, it was really interesting hearing about how it was hard for you to get the word out that people were not wanting to pick up the story, not wanting mm. to report on this really important story about how a white woman who had shared an article about white women tears had those same white women tears used against her. Yeah, so that's the thing. It was a, a black woman shared it, and and even beyond that. So I was trying to, I, you know, as I'd been in the media for twelve years, ten years, ten years at that point or more. Um, so we're talking about a black journalist who lost her job or potentially lost her job for sharing an article about racism written by an Australian journalist, Australian writer. How is that not a story to you? So. Mm -hmm. Um, the only um, the only outlet that picked it up was National Indigenous Television. So again, that's a, you know, and I big shout out um, for that solidarity and support. And not only that, for recognizing that this was a true story, like a real story. Right. Because, because at the time, and these stories are still, you know, this is still going on. Journalists are, uh, you know, about freedom of the press, and and um, you know, journalism is not a crime. And so all these sort of like, don't you know, don't punish journalists for doing their job. So. How how is, does this not fit into that you know that discourse um, of of, uh, of how is it yeah. how is it separate how is it something yeah they and it was just completely ignored and I was just like right okay so a you don't care um, about what's happened to to this journalist even though you sort of say that you care about all journalists and b um, I'm your colleague and I've been working alongside you for all these years a decade. Thank you for really showing me with no more sort of ifs, ands, or buts exactly mm -hmm. what you think of me, that you didn't, wouldn't even pick up the story and not even on the, you know, not even on a blog post or like as, as in the website of the newspaper. You know, so that, that was a, such a, um, yeah, that was a real, I wouldn't say wake-up call because I suspected as such, otherwise I wouldn't have been writing the book because at that point I was already writing the book, but I was kind of like, I was losing kind of a faith or, or you know, but um, what happened with to Lisa was really galvanised me to like, no, I've really got to keep mm, going with it. Keep going, uh, yeah. And so, you know, um, fortunately for Lisa, she, um, you know, the funny thing with that is that her lawyer, um, who's just, you know, this middle-aged uh, white man um, in her court case because because she was already filed for discrimination and then she filed for retaliation so she said when they fired her that that they didn't fire her because her, my article was offensive they fired her to retaliate against the lawsuit that she'd already brought against mm. them um, so he stood in coy with this big blown up um, print out of my article <laughs> and I'm just trying to imagine I wish I was there <laughs> Um, so you have this older white man explaining this concept of white, <laughs> white women's tears to this court, U.S. court of law. And uh, That's incredible. What? She won that part of her case. So she lost the discrimination That's case. That's amazing. Right. Bizarrely. Mm. She lost that case, but she won the retaliation case. So, wow. you know, in a sense like that, she was able to get some um, justice. She was able to get some vindication, uh, right. you know. Um, so, because you know, and I was horrified at first. I went from thinking I've completely, I've completely ruined this woman's life to being like, um, wow, okay. So, so my article in the end did help her. It, it did, it did help her get. 
some validation and, and, yeah. and just to be and, and justice and, you know, um, so, um, so it, 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 for her to keep going, you know, and that's what she said to me, like, it's because, you know, as other women of colour would know and you'd know it's so isolating and, and yes, uh, a problem is when, it, when you are a woman of colour who, who starts to assert herself and then you're not only targeted by white society, you'll, you'll often very quickly be abandoned by other people of colour, sadly, because mm. they're afraid, right? They're afraid that um, if they stick up for you, or then they'll be next. They will be impacted, and and this is the even more nuanced um, understanding that we have to under, that we have to like open ourselves up to, right? Which is how we as um, people of color become complicit in white supremacy mm. um, as a survival tactic, as a way of self protection. Um, as a way of maybe not having the language. And this is why I feel like your book is so important and books like this are so important because they give wider context. They give historical understanding. They join the dots together so that you can understand that it, it is a strategy. It is about power. It is not a one-off thing. It's not a personal thing. It's systemic and it's endemic. And I know for myself, having read your book, you know, one of the uh, ancestors that I was thinking about, living ancestors still, um, that I was thinking about as I was reading your book, that your book really was reminiscent to me of um, when I read Bell Hooks's Ain't I a Woman? And I know you quote her in the book, but I remember reading that book and thinking every person needs to read this book because without this understanding, this historical context, what's happening now doesn't make much sense or seems like it shouldn't still be here. But without that, mm. with that full context, yeah. yeah. And that's why I quote, and um, I, um, like, I, I wanted to quote or at least reference as many um, women, uh, black women and, and brown women and Asian women as I could mm -hmm. um, a, to show that we've been, Indigenous women have been writing about this for a long time. Um, and also, you know, to to show how deep and long this history runs. Um, yes. Um, and yeah, I, I um, you know, uh, a widow could. Her book is fantastic, by the way. And and, and I a woman, but but um, uh, it, I know I've lost my train of thought. But. <laughs> it, it, <it's>, um, <laughs> This is the thing. Like I, I know what I was going to say is, is I, um, I, you know, like I had so many quotes in my book at first. I still do, but but my editor was like, in Australia, it wasn't so much of a problem because they were all short quotes. But even right. you know, my editor in the US is like, um, there's too many quotes in here. You'll have to rephrase it. I'm like, how can there be too many quotes? So you have to credit. You know what I mean? You got right. It. And because, oh, there, think, and it has been, and this is something you, I think, I you've spoken about, about, copyright. Yeah. right? I think you've spoken about this or written about it in the book. Was that um, as you began doing your research on this book, you know, you found there are so many books about these different dynamics um, that mm. we have been writing about it for many, many years. We've been talking about it for for decades, um, for centuries, truly, and yet. Uh, we're in 2020 and there are still people who say, I, I didn't know, I had no idea. Mm. Right. That's, well, no, that's it. It's, that's, you know, that's, um, that's part of the whole racial privilege of, of that they have that, of, of not having to know or, you know, not, you not having to, to, interrogate what they see around them because that's something that I've got a lot of, of of you know I saw this but I didn't didn't know what was happening you know right I didn't I couldn't place it in in context of what was going on yeah um, that it wasn't it wasn't just a, a a conflict between these two women that something was happening here right where you know, the racial dynamics of our society and the power dynamics of our society were being played out. Mm. Um, and you, 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 you do share a lot of history in the book, but you also do share mm -hmm. a lot of um, 
current day stories of real life women and their experiences mm. with um, with these tools of white supremacy. You had the story of, I think her name was Danai in the book, who was, I believe, a mm. Zimbabwean uh, immigrant to mm-hmm. Australia um, and her issues in the workplace. And then Zaina, a Palestinian Canadian woman who mm-hmm. had her hair repeatedly touched in the workplace. And yeah. when she spoke out about it was told that she was she was the aggressor to the white woman it was a problem um these are everyday stories that women of color are are experiencing and carrying with them and you know the the book is called white tears brown scars like let's talk about the brown scars what are the scars the black and brown scars that we're carrying around with us yeah so i mean i said i said brown scars in the title um for brevity um and also because I'm, you know, I, well, I'm, you know, I'm Arab, um, so I sort of put myself in the brown, um, you know, ra- racial, you know, racial uh, uh, terminology and language, as we know, it's not, it's not, it's not perfect, it's not perfect. Yeah, my my son said to me the other day, because <laughs> he's still getting his head around mm. identities of like, why are you saying we're black or they're white when that isn't the color of our skin. So he's like, yeah, I know. I right, know. he's six. He's six years old. Yeah. So he's no, but it makes sense. It yeah, makes perfect it's... sense. He said to me out of nowhere the other day. He said, "You know, Mama, I know how you know if you're black." And he said, "I said, how do you know?" He said, "If your skin is brown, you are black." Mm. <laughs> I said, "Yes, true." <laughs> yeah. So he's still so, finding the nuance. But and you talk about yeah. this at the beginning of the book, yeah, right? I, like I set that out of of, of mm-hmm. my, you know. I just, you know, I know these these terms are not um, uh, precise, even in something like women of color, and I use that in the in the in the sort of the subtitle. And but it's I'm not uh, I say that at the start. I'm not saying that we're all, you know, to say that we're of color. That's not an identity in itself, right? right? That's just a. It's just it's really a political terminology, um, right? So and it I, kind of flattens our experiences. It and doesn't, does, it, yeah, right. it, when you're when you're using it. Um, when you're using it in in instances where you really should be more specific, so that's right. right. That's why. I, so throughout the book, and that's why I do talk about all the different archetypes. So because yes. there are, you know, it's, so when we say, you know, so you know, example I give is that if we're talking, if in Australia, if we're talking about, um, uh, you know, police brutality and incarceration and deaths in custody, we can't we can't say that that's a a POC issue, a people of colour issue. That's an Indigenous issue. That's a Black right. Australian, right? Right. Um, so there are absolutely instances where it's not appropriate to say people of colour. Where it's appropriate to say women of colour or people of colour is when you're when you're talking uh, in the in general terms of yes, you know. So white women, this concept of of, of white women weaponising their their um, their tears or weaponizing their femininity is something that affects all non-white people. Uh, so it, well, I can say that, but yes. know, there are, when there are when you're talking about you know, dispossession and that's an, that's an indigenous issue. So right, um, that's how, that's how I I try to navigate that, and it's Definitely. not, um, and it's a you know it, it's it's a uh, you know it, it's 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 a shame that maybe we haven't been reiterating um, what a term like that actually means and when it's appropriate to use it and when it's not yes uh but you know again we could come up with another term right and it would still right and it and i think the 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 thing to understand about it is it's still um it's still not representative of the fact that we are actually just one race right so when we're talking about races it is political it is it is yeah. a social concept and it talks about the ways that um, we are impacted or not impacted by systems of oppression. Um, mm-hmm. But that is changeable over time as well, because who is white gets changed over time and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. But this idea of the scars that we carry, um, mm-hmm. one thing that I know is that those scars are often invisible to white people. Yeah, so that's a point. I so yes, that's what I was. That's what you asked if when I sort of uh, I got I got off track. So the idea of the white is around scars. So I say 
brown in the title, but yes, it's brown and, and black. It's, it's a, it, that, that applies to, um, I, I say brown because I, I don't feel at liberty to say black in the title of the book when I'm yes. not black. Um, right. So that's where I took kind of poetic license there it's to say in this title only, right. I'm, saying, I'm saying brown to A, let you know where I am in this whole sort of racial scheme of things and also to, to, as a, to apply to all, uh, all people of colour. Um, but, yeah, so, so the brown, the scars are, you know, it, it's like the, um, it's almost like the price. You know, the white tears, the, the, the cost, the cost of white tears, the suffering behind white tears is not white suffering. Mm. It's black suffering. It's indigenous right. suffering. And it, it's, 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 it's brown suffering. But it's also our resistance, right? And so I chose the word scars deliberately because, you know, when I was going through it, it was like brown pain, brown trauma, brown tear. And I'm like, no, all of these, not brown tears, brown uh, uh, um, wounds, you know. So it's coming up with all these words, but scars to me was the best because, A, it, it, um, it, it's a sign of, yeah, you've, there's been, um, you know, a, a trauma, a physical or mental trauma, a wound has happened, something yes. has happened. Um, but there's a resilience and there's a, a, right. a, um, a, a, a healing that's obviously never quite healed because, you know, until we really truly reckon with it, um, it can't. But we're able, we, we, we keep going. Um, right. And then it becomes part of your character. It becomes part of you. You, know, you get used to that. Um, but yeah, so so that's what the, the the scars is meant to. Um, but yeah, it's it's the, the 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 suffering, you know, is is born from the the or experienced by the 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 the, the black and the brown and the indigenous and but you know the, the and, victimhood and is claimed by by white whiteness. I think as well. Um, you spoke about the scars, resilience, and I hadn't thought about it from that perspective mm. actually. But what I was thinking about is how, you know, when you have a scar, like you hurt yourself real bad, maybe as a kid, and um, you still have that scar now as an adult, right? That's a that's a physical sign on your body, like not to do something like that ever again. Um, mm. I think those scars really are the reminder to us oftentimes that, okay, it's not safe to be around white women or it's not safe to be mm. fully ourselves around white women. Um, here's yeah. the proof, right? Um, here's how I got hurt. And yet mm -hmm. we're also expected to act as if those scars don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great, yeah. Uh, and, or that they're, it's healed. Oh, whatever. It's, you know, it's over. Get over it. How we can get that. But right. um, it's still there. I can see it. And every time I look at it, I remember. Um, yeah, I keep going, but I remember. Right. Um, what's been the, done and I know the consequences if I do it again and if I have to live this way then I'm not again I'm not being allowed to I'm not a, I'm not being allowed to live in my full humanity mm -hmm. but you know but you know what like you know and I don't want to be like oh well, white people suffer too but they've been deprived of their humanity um because of this because they can't be who they can't be their full human self, right? If, if that always, if 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 they're, they can only, you know, if it has to come at our expense, you right? Know? And um, you know what what what's something that's happening here is is uh, 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 the the there's been some sacred trees um, in Victoria, um, uh, so sacred to the Japurong people, the Japurong women especially. So they're birthing trees, ancient birthing trees, um, mm. and they're they're just magnificent. And uh, they they want to build a highway. The, 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 the Victorian state government wants to lengthen, uh, widen the highway. Um, so so they've been uh, fighting. The women, the the Japurong women, have been fighting to to save these trees, uh, but they chop they chop one down yesterday and they did it when um it was the final day of of the lockdown in melbourne so melbourne's been going through a really harsh lockdown because of covid 
So on the day that the lockdown was eased and everyone was celebrating um, this, this not only magnificent and beautiful, but the, it, it, you know, speaking of ancestors, like that's an ancestor to yes. the Indigenous people. So um, look, no, I'm getting emotional. I can't even comprehend how that, you know, that the immense loss and tragedy of that. Uh, so, you know, that's a scar. I, I, that's a scar. And that, that, is, that to me is indicative of the humanity that whiteness has lost. Mm. Because, because how you can justify that for the sake of a more efficient highway. There's no, uh, you know, at the same time as, as um, saying, or A, you're celebrating because you're in the lockdown. We're all in this together, yay. And then mm. also, you know, you say that, that um, you know, we're, we're all more learning to, you know, learning more about our history of, you know, the, the, the long history of, of the cultures or the indigenous cultures that were here before colonization, recognizing, you know, the land and, and, the, and the, which people were on which land and that they're still there and they're still, right. still here. Um, so you're, you're saying that, um, but at the same time, like that's talking the talk, that's the facade, right? That's right. what I was talking about earlier. Right. That's you presenting yourself. But that violence, of, yes, of, and it is of, violence. It, it is absolutely. Violence. It's, it's, yes, it's violence and it's cultural vandalism, environmental vandalism, um, mm-hmm. and so completely unnecessary. And, and that you know, so when I say that whiteness has cost white people their humanity, to me, that's part of that because there's 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 a, 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 a um, you know, someone in, in touch with their humanity is going to recognize you know all the sort of the 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 history and the, the, the people and the Indigenous people and the women and the pleas and, and it's like this, this is a part of us. Oh, yes. You know, you say, you it, say that you reconciliation and treaty with us. Yeah. But this action is showing that you really don't. And, and that to me, that, that makes me, you know, that adds another layer of, of the tragedy and the sadness. And I'm like, that, that, that there's, you know, we're, we're, we're not allowed to live, we as in people of colour, of our full expression of humanity because it's perceived as threatening. Right. Um, and at the same time, um, because of whiteness, uh, white society and many white people have lost their humanity because they're able to just so casually enact this kind of violence without... Um, Without, and it's the word, you know, spiritual violence has been coming to me mm. since you've been speaking, that to do that is an act of spiritual violence as well. And um, mm. one of the concepts um, that you talked about in the book that um, I hadn't, I just hadn't heard talked about this way was this like, there were three, three different archetypes you used. One, I think may have been one that you created and then two you quoted. So uh, the great white mother, um, mm-hmm. uh, Margaret D. Jacobs talked about maternal colonialism, um, and Barbara Ramasek talked about maternal imperialism. And all of these are terms which speak to the, the maternalistic role that white women in colonial times played Mm -hmm. in the kidnapping, abduction, taking of children of color and indigenous children from their mothers, which to me is a form of spiritual violence to remove a child from their mother um, in these so-called good intentions um, of rescuing these children from from what I don't know, from their so-called wretchedness as indigenous people. You know, this is yet another layer of this spiritual violence. Yeah, and again, that's something that's not um, that hasn't been accounted or or even acknowledged. Um, in that, it, it's uh, you know we're, we're, when we try to talk about uh, at ways in women of color to attempt to talk about uh, the role that white women have played, it's like, well, don't blame us for what men did, and it's like, no, 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 um, white women have always played. Uh, a more proactive role. It wasn't just, they weren't just sitting by mm-hmm. 
uh, uh, so you know, in, in the case of um, in Indigenous uh, child removal, so Margaret Jacobs, because she talks about uh, the parallels between Indigenous removals in the US and in Australia, um, and in Australia in particular, uh, yes, it was the men in the politicians that, that were signing off, right? Being like, yep. But the people who were actually going and taking the children were mostly the white, white, the white women. So the actual physical taking Act, them away, right? Yeah. So, so that is um, that's not just like oh well, it's what the men did. You can't, you know, that 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 we can't um. You know that, that's where this this uh, this tension of, because of the role and because of the history of how white women were subordinated by white men, because um, white women are always you know because their feminism is is only sort of centered around gender. That's yes. all they see, and, and that's all they see and focus on um, how the women back then were treated by the white men. But so they don't they don't expand it to be like well then how did the white women then replicate? that dynamic right. with the with the the colonized populations and that's one of the ways in which um they did it which it was that they fully and enthusiastically um supported um racial like segregation and indigenous removals and racial superiority um yeah so that so is and and we yeah. see that even today, right? So we're talking about these are terms that are about, you know, colonial times, but we see it, for example, in the way that um, white teachers treat black kids and kids of color in the, in the dynamics mm -hmm. in, um, you know, foster care, in the dynamics in adoption, in the, so many, so many situations in which this role of the great white mother who's going to rescue black and brown children from their parents, um, from their oh own God. culture, um, because that is something lesser than, and they are giving them a better chance, apparently. Mm -hmm. And that they were supposed to be grateful for it, that this is something that yeah. we're supposed to be grateful for. So I, I guess what I'm wondering is, if white people were not so concerned about us and controlling us or, um, proving that they are superior to us in some way, what would they do with that energy? And what could they do with that energy that would be productive, that would be helpful, that would give them back their humanity, that would allow us to have our own humanity? Um, look, that's, you know, like that's the... That's, that's the, question. the big question. Uh, it's about um, how I put it is that it's, it, it, in a sense, it, it, it's I'm... I'm asking or challenging white women to take that leap of faith of if I can give up the, the sense of superiority, even though I might not see it that way, um, I might just see it as being my right, so, you know, to, to be the one that's first up the ladder, right? Um, but if they can uh, to take that leap of faith of, of that, we can be there to catch them as well because even though you know i get pushed back against the work i do as, as you've done and other women of color and black women especially have done everything i know that we do is we're not giving up on white people we're asking them we're asking them to actually really be one people um yeah so it, it, it's not a you know so so for me it's like take that leap of faith of that you, you'll give up what you've been conditioned to believe is your entitlement and your right and that there's something about you that is special because you're white um, and see what the possibilities are um, of, of, of a deeper connection with other people and with yourself. Right, uh, because and, I, think, you know, I think that's so key because for me, you know, I'm – in, in this journey for me, you know, I've had to really, it's really made it clear to me where my internalized inferiority has been, where my internalized mm. white supremacy against myself has been, my internalized anti-blackness. And so in me doing my healing work, the more that I continue to do that, the more I'm like, 
I'm actually fine. I don't need you to do this work for me because I know, I know I am a human being. I know mm-hmm. I'm a whole human being. I know that you don't need to recognize me in order for me to know that. But the fact of the matter is I still have to deal with your racism, even though exactly. I know who I am. Mm-hmm. Right. And so um, in doing this work, like in the work that I do, which is very much centered on guiding people with white privilege through this process of looking in the mirror, seeing that they do believe that they are superior and then picking it all apart. You know, the first part is instead of thinking about how bad racism is for people of color, how bad is it for you to have to Mm. live with this, for you to have to live with defending superiority? This is the thing. Like it's, it's, you you are not being allowed to rest either because you're constantly having to um, find ways to justify this uh, obviously um, wrong <laughs> assertion that that there's something about white whiteness and white people I should say that that is is uh, entitles them or is, is better right so. If they're if they have all the good jobs or they're the ones that are on TV or on the radio, etc., that's just because that's just that, that's merit, right? They got their right. own merit, you know. So, so um, if they're not having to too constantly um, fight that, then yeah, that frees up a lot of emotional energy and and um, you know, like one of the things you know as I talk about towards the end of the book is that we we are. You know, and I wrote the book before COVID. So, like, we were, you know, as I say, we're, we're all, we're, our society is sick. Like, our planet is sick because of our actions. Um, we have to find another way. Like, this is, this can't go on um, yeah. um, because this constant race for superiority, which other, and I say that as well in the book, we're, we're, we're buying into it, other people of colour and the capitalist system that was created by the West, um, has spread everywhere, and so has this the the system of um, you know white skin uh, privilege and colorism. So we buy you know as in people we we there's, there's so much anti blackness in Arab societies, and mm-hmm. there's so you know and in Indian societies and everywhere. And but then it, there's also within you know right. uh, communities of of colorism. So the whole world has now like been sort of infected. Uh, yeah, really, with mm-hmm. with with this this concept of whiteness that that white you know that white is right, um, mm-hmm. and that the way one way I- 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 even if you're not um, accepted as you know fully white, you know, like say an Arab, like like me, Levantine Arab, um, is to then assert our own superiority against people who are darker than us so you know mm-hmm. so against black arabs or black africans and and mm-hmm. so you know um that's 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 what we find ourselves in and then what's happening environmentally and with our health like like something's got to give um and this is something that is beyond uh, feminism, you know, so like this whole idea, you know, people will say, like, I'll, I'm just often described, I'm describe myself though as an intersectional feminist, and I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, there's, there's, I'm not, uh, there's no shade on, on, on Kimberly Crenshaw's theory. I engage with it deeply, and I, uh, um, but the, it's, it's, feminism is not enough, right? Like, mm. we, we have to, we're beyond that now because, um, you know, the, 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 <laughs> we're, we're our planet it's dying. all of us right yeah, it's all of us yeah. and the planet so, so and right how, yeah, how 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 can we not only reconcile with each other mm-hmm. as humans um how can we reintegrate back in to this environment uh you know one way is to listen to indigenous people but instead of doing that we're we're ripping up their trees right so like that's this is how this is all connected and and so it, this is this goes beyond just trying to find a better feminism and, and um, it, it's, it's uh, how, because it, it's just too much at stake now. Well, it's always been at stake, but, it, but it's getting more and more so. But, but yeah, so. So, um, so as we. As we I, I, I always go off track. So, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. But this is, this is really important because I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, for our listeners who are 
I, who I am imploring to get your book and to read it. Um, it's, it's so fantastic. Um, with all the work that you poured into this body of work, this book, and for the people who are going to read it and um, be impacted by because we know when we people read our book, there are going to be people who read it and say that's a bunch of whatever and throw it out, right? Mm, but there are people who are, they're going to read it and it really wakes them up and it really, it changes things for them. For those people, what do you want this information, this consciousness mm. to create in action? What do I want? Mm -hmm. um, well, like that's, you know, I, I, I at the end of my book, I, I, I you know, I, I give a list of questions to white women, um, which I then say these are not rhetorical, like I want, you know. And when you to actually whether, engage whether, with whether, these questions. Whether it's, yeah, so whether right. it's a, a response that you write that I can see or whether you're just uh, in uh, uh, answering the questions to yourself and engaging with it. So, so like what I want, you know, uh, and, and that's a hard question. What do I want to see? Like I, I wrote this book to, as a record of witnessing, yes. you know, and, and I wrote it for women of color who, so they have a framework. Yes. Of, so what they've experienced isn't their own moral failing or their own failing. And it's 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 part of this bigger system um, that was rigged against them before they were even born, mm -hmm. so they couldn't. Uh, uh, but yes, obviously, I want white people to read it to and and to get something out. So so I guess for me, I guess I'm uh, the main thing is, are you brave enough? Are you brave enough to give up whiteness for humanity? Because to me, you can't have both. It's impossible. And I also give that ask that question to other people of color who are not black or indigenous. Are you brave enough to not appeal to whiteness? And, and you know that's why I did embrace it. Well, uh, there wasn't say embrace it. I have reservations, but I use the term people of color and women of color because uh, as, even though I'm not, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm a fair skinned person, it is because I'm saying that I don't, I will not appeal to whiteness. Right. I don't aspire to that. I want, I recognize it. It's not only that I, I know and experience racism on my, 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 my family and my, my ancestors and ongoing imperialism. Right. It's that I very firmly say I reject um, any aspiration to whiteness mm. because I will not be a part of that. Mm. Um, I don't, that's not the world that I want. Um, so, yeah, that's, so I guess I want, that's what I would like. It is, and then what action comes out of that? It's up to yes. It's up to the people. It depends who they are, how much agency they have, how much right. power they have. You know, how yes. much power they have. So you know, a, a white person in power, it would be you know, to go back to those trees. Is would you be brave enough to, if you're in politics, to have been able to put a stop to that? You may have risked your job, but is this something you could have done? Mm. Because that. To me, like it's just such, it's beyond that one tree. It's just such a sign that of uh, where Australia uh, sits in relation to first and foremost, it's, it's the Indigenous mm. and First Nations. Uh, yeah. That, yes. That was, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's okay. No, so, I, was doing, I, was I, I, I think I finished what I was saying. So, yeah. Yes. Um, you know, this has been a really incredible conversation. There's so much, there's actually so much more that you write about in your book that I wish we could dive into, but I'm also, it's also important to leave more to the, to our listeners to go, yeah. explore, to go and yeah. explore for themselves. They don't want to so give much. everything, but it's, yeah, you did an incredible oh, job. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I will say like when I first, I mean, I wrote this book literally because women of colour asked me to. I had no intention, you know, but, but because that article, you know, went gangbusters and women uh, of colour, you know, of various backgrounds on, yeah. on Twitter mostly yeah. saying, okay, now that you've done, you've set off this little bomb, like are you just going to let it go back to normal or are you going to keep this conversation going? And I was just like, uh, what do you mean? And they're like, hey, you get to write a book. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Is there a book in this? And first I was like, and all this was going on on Twitter. I'm like, okay. 
I know I could do an anthology and I could edit it and that way other women of colour can tell their stories. Um, but then the response I had to that was that that is that might be very beautiful and moving, but is that going to change policies? Is that going to change people's minds? And so I was like, I see what you mean. Yes. So I did it, you know, I was like, well, I do have an obligation now because I am now in a position of privilege where I, I know that if I did say I want to write this book, I could. Right. Um, because, you know, so I felt to me that it had actually become a, a duty and an obligation, not in the sense of, oh, God, but an obligation of like, no, this yeah, is, well, I, I have, I, this is my way of, of giving back. And, and right. So, yeah. I see it as you um, answering the call to your good ancestorship. Yeah. You know, this yeah, is this is something that is out in the world. Nobody can ever put it back. You know, it's yeah. it's out there now and it will always be there. And it is a witnessing record, as you say, um, not only of people's real life stories, but also of, like I've said, like connecting the dots throughout yeah. time to see yeah. how this is all connected. Mm. So I just really, I really want to thank so, you yeah, for well, thank the you. time, the energy, the emotional labor, the research, the honoring of so many different stories across the world, um, people who have been impacted by colonialism and white supremacy. It's just an incredible book. And I really want everyone to get it. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, you know, thank you for having me to, to talk. And I know I, I rambled, but I, I was going to answer that really quickly and say when I started the book, I was thinking, do I have, is there a book in this? How mm. can I write a whole book on this? <laughs> but then in the process of research, I was like, oh, my goodness, how can I only write one book on this? Like wow, there's, like yes. The, 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 the history uh, not only of what has happened, but of resistance and, and all the women and, and, and men of colour too who, who have resisted and written back and spoken back. And, and so I wanted to, to honour that as well. Um, Thank so, yeah, you. There, was there was definitely more than just a book in it. So Well, I can't yeah. wait to see, you know, what comes next for you. I know that Thank there's you. so much Thank more inside of you and I can't wait to read it all. Um, our final question, Ruby what does it mean to you to be a good ancestor? Yeah, so that question, you're, uh, uh, as we just said, for me, it's about um, doing what I can to um, not, uh, you know, not, not just so, you know, try to make the world better, but, but what, what can I do to make, can I start that again? Yes, because <laughs> this is, and I will say, what I will say about this as well, this is a question I that I thought I had I'm, my question or I yeah. thought I had my response sorted out, but I'm like, oh, this is such an important question. I, I well, it, and it's a question that I think is, for me personally, always evolving over time. So mm -hmm. what does it mean to you right now in this moment? Right now, mm -hmm. you know, it's about uh, what I said earlier. It's a, it's an, uh, it's about witnessing and speaking to what you see um with it, within you know what the parameters you have and, and so uh i i you know i guess that's you know as you said my book is a contribution to that so in, in the sense of what i'm trying to do to be a good ancestor with this book is to bring back light on what women and men before me mm. um, have said and, and have done to resist, mm. you know, to, 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 bring, to bring that back out. You know, I, I, um, I, I the, the epigraph or the dedication on my book is for the forgotten ones. So to me, to be in an ancestor, a good ancestor, is to remind the forgotten ones that they're not forgotten um mm. and that may be to lay the groundwork so you know so that there is no more sort of silencing in the future yeah that's beautiful that's a beautiful answer thank you yeah. ruby <laughs> i had a different one but it sort of just didn't, just didn't, it didn't seem appropriate anymore after this discussion so uh, yeah well thank beautiful. you though. thank you so much thank you for coming on the show um, and, uh, yes, everybody, please go get this book. You will not regret it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, well, it's been, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you. Look, it's completely bright outside. <laughs> <laughs>
the sun has come up. On, the sun, the sun has pole. come up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. This is Leila Saad, and you've been listening to Good Ancestor Podcast. I hope this episode has helped you find deeper answers on what being a good ancestor means to you. We'd love to have you join the Good Ancestor Podcast family over on Patreon, where subscribers get early access to new episodes, patron-only content and discussions, and special bonuses. Join us now at patreon.com forward slash good ancestor podcast. Thank you for listening, and thank you for being a good ancestor.